Hello everyone, uh, I'm Nigel Sisman, Business Area Manager Markets from, from Entsog, uh, and I'd like to rerun uh, part of a uh, presentation that I gave earlier today to the Florence School of Regulation training course. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about some of the work that my team are involved in, uh, but also uh, to give some insights into some of the work that my colleague Andrea Cherlikova uh, and her team have been doing in relation to the 10-year network development plan. Uh, the structure for the uh, talk that I'll give will be a little bit about ENSOG and its role. I'd then like to, to say a few words about the 10-year network development plan uh, and I'd like to talk uh, generally about some of the issues associated with financing infrastructure um, in, the, in the current uh, environment. Uh, before I start, I always like to start with uh, this slide. Um, ENTSOG is an organisation that comprises um, a very substantial proportion of all the, uh, the, the TSOs in Europe. Um, they're increasingly, there, there are TSOs being created and they very quickly come on board. And we also uh, have some associated partners and observers within the organisation. Uh, we have a very broad coverage and uh, we have an, an enormous effort uh, from our members in terms of actually supporting the work that we do, which is making progress towards the single internal energy market. But before I, I go into the, the real element of the presentation, I have to say a few words really about the nature um, of our members, you know, who are all now unbundled TSOs. Uh, I think that the TSOs have two quite distinct roles in the new world. Uh, they are responsible providing the assets that deliver transportation services to people who want to use the gas network in Europe. And they also have a very significant role in relation to information and the balancing of the system, which I tend to regard as about the TSOs being supportive of market developments. I think it's also good to note that the TSO core revenue streams essentially come from the provision of assets and uh, the transmission services that they offer. Um, that also covers a lot of the information role, but in relation to balancing, uh, the TSOs uh, have a slightly different role of facilitating the market, and therefore there is a concept called neutrality, which is particularly important, uh, which means that TSOs can be encouraged to do things that are market supportive, but they are not exposed to the commodity risks that arise in the gas balancing regime. So therefore, TSOs are performing a fundamental enabling role without the inherent hedges of incumbents these days. And the goal is clearly to develop um, a framework that will support the delivery of the internal energy market by the end of 2014. Our mission is therefore very simply to deliver on the third package requirements that are defined for ENSOG and those focus very much on the development of network codes and also on the development of the 10-year network development plans. And I will cover both of those uh, in the presentation today. And I think it's very important to note that our commitment is to work on those two areas and to listen and be responsive to a broad range of actors and stakeholders and that we should seek to identify and promote um, the, the, the options that have the best prospect of delivering a properly functioning market. An interesting slide here, the, the transportation network is obviously a very complex network. I mean, a collection of pipe works, an awful lot of infrastructure, and that sort of sophistication is not ideal when you want to create a very, very simple market in which people can bring gas onto the system, trade it and deliver it to consumers. So we, we have an idea to go towards entry and exit zones. This is now prescribed in the legislation and I think we refer to it as the creative simplification. It is a very simple model. It is something which needs to be implemented in a way which is fit for purpose and it needs to respect the fact that it cannot perfectly match the physical reality but there are often uh, some inefficiencies that, that we can accept 
uh, in terms of the physical operation of the network if it creates greater benefits in respect of the properly functioning market. And ENSOG is effectively uh, an organisation comprising the TSOs because their expertise is absolutely crucial to delivering the functioning of the market and it is the TSO's networks which form the foundation for the properly functioning market. I'd like now to move on to uh, an area of work that ENSOG is engaged in, the 10-year network development plan, and I now speak on behalf of, of Andrea Chelikova and, and her team. Um, methodology is everything in respect of this particular exercise. Um, the network is incredibly complicated, and so we need to define uh, a simplified representation of the network to be able to accomplish the task. In practice, what this means is that each entry-exit zone is realised um, as a, a particular demand for gas on the system that corresponds to consumer demands. And we also monitor um, and actually feature within the model um, national production, LNG and underground storage facilities. Because, of course, there is cross-border transfer of gas, we also need to capture within the model imports into a particular entry-exit zone and exports from an entry-exit zone. When we then start to build that together, we build up um, a network representation comprising a, a series of nodes and interconnections. Associated with these, there will be transmission capacities that we will take from uh, the network, sorry, from the TSOs. And we will actually effectively model the capability for the system to be able to move gas from one location to another. It is necessarily a very simplified physical representation of the European grid, and it actually features daily capacities for the zonal entry and exit by the various types. So national production is modelled as one element in each particular zone if it exists, and similarly LNG, underground storage and pipeline import and export capability. Now in order to operate this network model, there are some very, very key methodolo methodological elements that I would like to just expose to you. Uh, one of the concerns that I think we have about the way that the, the model is interpreted is that it's very important that people understand the fundamental building blocks upon which the various elements of the model are actually built. So the model reflects the underlying infrastructure. That means that it effectively represents both existing and potential new assets that would come into existence in the network. The approach distinguishes between FID, and to break the jargon, that means final investment decision. And in that, what I mean is, there are some projects that will have already had a final investment decision taken, and therefore they are viewed as a cluster of projects and feature within the model. Additionally, we will have intelligence about other projects which may well go ahead, but for which final investment decisions have not been taken, the non-FID projects. And those will be used in some of the sim simulations that we do to effectively determine whether additional infrastructure may be required to deliver an acceptable level of system resilience. Similarly, there are some other very significant elements that have to feed into the, mo into the model. For example, demand has to be represented, and we have a number of cases. First of all, we have what we call the design condition scenario, which is where the actual design conditions that individual TSO use actually provide the basis for inputs to the model. But of course, being Europe, this naturally means that there will be a degree of diversity associated with the design conditions. So ine inevitably, to try and deliver something which is strictly comparable, we have a concept of a one-day uniform risk, which is designed to determine demands which are consistent 
with a 5% probability of occurring, therefore a 1 in 20 likelihood. And essentially what we're trying to do is to develop you know, an approach where information is standardised. Now that is a challenge because many TSOs have not worked in exactly that way, and so that is something that we are progressively working towards. And also in the model, it's not just the single day that may be critical, because particularly long, harsh periods could actually mean that there could be significant depletion of underground storage, for example. And so we've also introduced a similar concept relating to the 14-day uniform risk scenario. On the supply side, we have assessed nat national production levels, potential for pipeline imports, LNG likelihood, UGS, and possibly, and also, the likelihood and the timing and the scale of new supplies into the European grid. Now, of course, it's very difficult to determine exactly which scenarios we should use. And so if you review the documentation that has been supplied with the latest version of the 10-year network development plan, which is currently out for consultation, you will see a detailed explanation of how the various supply levels have been determined. And Andrea's team would be particularly pleased to get feedback from you as a result of that consultation, you know, to see how you feel about infrastructure modelling, demand scenarios, the supply side, and indeed the underlying model in the NEMO, the network modelling uh, tool, which Andrea's team have developed. It would be wrong of me not to present just a few samples um, of the presentation material which exists in the report. Um, but I will go very quickly through three or four of them and I really encourage you to have a look at the document. It is available online or alternatively you can choose to print it out. I think the, the graphics and the content of the main textual document require um, further study because we think it's important that people understand the underlying assumptions that are fed into the, to the model. For example, we have to talk about the annual demand situation. And using the sort of bottom-up approach of consolidating all the information from our members, we get a picture which portrays a possibility of a very slight growth over the period 2013 to 2012 in aggregate at European level. But of course there is very considerable variation when we look at what the position is like in individual countries. For example, the two biggest uh, current national demands are in the UK and Germany, and those are predicted to go down a little bit over the course of the period to 2022. Whereas there are a number of other countries where very significant growth is anticipated, possibly covering you know, a degree of recovery from the recent recession. So people need to have a look at the document and we would really value you know, feedback on whether people feel that the assumptions that have been used are valid and the sorts of conclusions that have been drawn in the current 10-year network development plan. In relation to supply, um, there is a lot of analysis been done about the various sourcing of gas that can come in and there are particularly you know, significant possibilities for both LNG to come in and for new sources of gas. The view is that perhaps shale gas is unlikely to be material up until, you know, sort of beyond 2022. Uh, but there are graphics here that clearly indicate that Europe looks to be fairly well provided for in terms of access to gas. The issue about what it might cost, of course, is an entirely separate matter. And that's why I think it's important that we get the commercial regime established as best we can so that Europe actually becomes an attractive destination for gas and that we can encourage competition between supply sources so that we can get the most attractive prices for consumers. There are further illustrations within the document about the extent of infrastructure resilience. The, the picture is quite good, but it's pretty clear 
that there can be some significant disruptions based on the experiences that we've had over recent years. And if those should occur, and these diagrams illustrate you know, the potential uh, effects arising from disruption of transit through Belarus and separately through Ukraine, then some parts of Europe could be very, very tight, implying that there may be some benefits coming from additional infrastructure. In relation to supply source diversification, one of the ideas that people have is that, that the individual sources of gas should be able to penetrate farther into the European grid so that we actually have competition between supply sources. And there are some very interesting pictures there which give an indication really of where, looking forward, the greatest extent of competition might take place. And that may actually give an indication really about some of the potential values associated with building infrastructure. So a very interesting document. Uh, we hope that as many of you as possible will give that some attention. And if you can respond to Andrea's uh, team, you know, with your feedback on the document, that would be very, very well received. So moving on, this takes us on to the final question, which is really, what about actually investing in infrastructure? Now, this is a big challenge at the moment. And I illustrate uh, the issue with this particular diagram. The reality is that our assets are long-lived. Typically, uh, they have an economic life of 40, 50 years. That would take us from here until perhaps 2060. But of course, nobody really knows quite what the gas situation is going to be in 2060. And indeed, there is a lot of uncertainty about what the future of the industry might be. So it'll be fair to say that TSOs can sometimes be a little bit nervous about spending very, very significant monies associated with very long-lived assets unless they can be confident about their return and recovery on the investment that they make and that they will be confident that they can get rewarded for any operational costs that they may have associated with the new assets. So to give you an example, let's imagine that we have a profile of cash that we need to get to adequately finance and reward an investment. We may be able, if we're lucky, to be able to get a commitment perhaps for 10 to 15 years for some users who are prepared to commit to purchase capacity at what is essentially a fair price for that period. The question then is what happens after that? There unquestionably will be some later network user purchases of capacity, but it's very, very difficult to ascertain how confident we can be of that. And that leaves us with a residual risk that if the capacity is not booked, that there are some costs that need to be borne somewhere, either by consumers or via the TSOs. But if those costs are visited on the TSOs, then it will only serve to increase the TSO's requirements to earn a return, ultimately increasing the costs to end consumers. So the market is looking at an approach which tries to develop a market test. Now this is really designed to address the issue that it would be unrealistic to expect the assets to be fully underwritten, but there needs to be a broader regulatory contract which is particularly relevant to the TSOs and to the, to the network users, but is also relevant to future generations of players who might have to foot the bill for infrastructure. And SIA are currently working on that, and we would expect to hear more about their ideas. But the slide here illustrates symbolically the approach which has been advocated by many market players, particularly EFET, that we should be looking to perform a market test and that there needs to be some degree of socialisation to ensure that we can get adequate infrastructure built to meet the needs of the market. Of course, we could adopt different approaches to addressing the long-lived nature of assets. 
One of them would be to depreciate the assets over a much shorter time period. And the diagram here illustrates that we could accelerate the depreciation so that we actually remove some of the risk from the TSOs and from the longer term consumers, you know, who may be there in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But unfortunately, there are no free lunches in this environment. And therefore, if we are to do that, there has to be an acceptance that there would be a higher transmission charge occurring in the earlier part of the asset's life than later on. And therefore, that means that transmission prices you know, may need to go up to actually address the issue about longer term uncertainty. So to conclude, the network code developments are happening. We have established very good working relationships in relation to the code developments, particularly with balancing, but we need to be conscious of the fact that the codes are getting harder, particularly tariffs, and that implementation will bring new and very real challenges. The 10-year network development plan is actually a very critical tool for the market. The methodology needs to be understood and we'd encourage stakeholders to get deep into the detail of the documents that we published and to participate in our open sessions to provide us with feedback that can only strengthen the document and its usefulness to the market. We really do need to get a properly functioning market and our preliminary view is that the assets are pretty close to what we need, but there may be some additional requirements that could further encourage the market to flourish, develop, and actually deliver the greatest possible level of competition between supply sources. And in relation to investment, we need to be conscious that there are no free lunches. Long-lived assets have a very uncertain future you know, with gas. We don't know what will happen to utilisation and therefore we need to enter into a mature grown-up discussion about how those risks should be shared and how should therefore the regulatory contract evolve to satisfy both the political aspirations and the commercial realities. Thank you very much.